Okay, well, let me start by thanking the organizers of the current conference to give me this tricky task of reviewing post-Keynesian macroeconomics uh, over the last 20 years. Um, but before I start, let me also um, express my gratitude and my, uh, yeah, my gratitude uh, for the development of this network. As Philip mentioned and Torsten mentioned again, I've been involved a whole lot in establishing and evolving, developing this network, but I more or less stopped in 2009. And then other people took over, uh, namely Till van Trake, who is here, not here, uh, for a couple of years, and currently uh, Sebastian Gechert, who is where? There. So uh, they have carried the load, and they have carried the flame, and they have further developed this network with the help of the organization com committees and with the help of the coordination committees, and I would like to thank them for that. So if you want to thank people, please thank these people. As I said, I was given this rather tricky task of reviewing post-Keynesian macroeconomics, and when thinking about this topic, I was a bit inclined to, to make a kind of uh, exercise in self-inspection, uh, because uh, we are not only celebrating the 20th anniversary of this conference, uh, I also celebrate the 20th anniversary, anniversary of my, the submission and the defense of my doctoral dissertation to the Free University of Berlin, on uh, money, effective demand, and capital accumulation in Keynes, uh, in Marx, Keynes, and the post-Keynesians. So I was tempted to just think about what have I learned since then. But then I thought, nobody might be interested in that. Uh, therefore, what I've tried is to review the major developments of post-Keynesian economics over the last 20 years, uh, and I'm sure there are other people in the audience who are much better equipped doing that. Uh, I see Marc Lavoie down there who has written two large textbooks on that. Uh, but I will try to give it a try. Um, I have to start with an apology. Although I do not want to be, uh, give a very, very subjective view on my own development, I'm not claiming that what I will present will be comprehensive because there has been so much in post-Keynesian economics over the last 20 years. And uh, in particular, my fellow uh, senior and junior colleagues in the audience, if you don't find your name on the PowerPoints which I will present, it might be due to a lack of space. There's a paper which I've tried to write over the summer. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's already been uploaded to the website. Uh, please look at that paper, because I think I have 10 or 15 pages of references. If you don't find your name in the list of references, and you think you've contributed to post-Keynesian macroeconomics, and I just missed it, please let me know. And I will then try to revise the paper. So what I'm going to present is a bit in between my, my own development, so to speak, but trying to be uh, substantial uh, with respect of post-Keynesian macroeconomics as a whole. Now, my presentation has basically uh, three parts. So in the first part, I will try to define what is this post-Keynesian economics, and I will link this up with what I've done uh, this afternoon or this morning in the graduate student workshop. So graduate students will rediscover some of the things which I've ex explained more in detail this morning. But this will only be a minor part. The major part is then uh, by section three, in, I, in which I would like to address three areas in which I would claim that post-Keynesian macroeconomics has contributed a whole lot and is far superior to what we've known as mainstream new consensus macroeconomics, uh, which has so desperately failed uh, in the face of the recent crisis, both in terms of explaining the crisis and in terms of providing or recommending the appropriate tools to overcome the crisis. Now these will be, in particular, the integration of distributional issues into short and long-run macro, the integrated analysis of money, finance, and macro, and then the policy implications drawn from, from that, full alternative macro models, which I would argue are far superior to the new consensus model. 
And I will finish with some final thoughts on open questions. Of course, there are a whole lot of open questions and areas of debate uh, and areas of future research. And I will uh, have a few notes on pluralism because that is the topic of this year's conference. So let me start with the beginning. So what is post-Keynesian economics? And I'll try to be very brief on that uh, because the more senior people know what is post-Keynesian economics, if they consider themselves to be post-Keynesians and the juniors or grad students have been exposed to that this afternoon. So I'd use, again, Mark's work, which, is, um, which I can highly recommend to everybody here. Mark Lavoie has, in his latest textbook, uh, distinguished heterodox and orthodox economics. And post-Keynesian economics is one of the schools in heterodox economics um, according to five presuppositions. And I don't want to explain them in detail, because this might uh, take a whole uh, talk, I would just like to mention them. So heterodox schools in terms of estim estim est epistemology and ontology um, uh, start from realism, whereas orthodox schools apply more or less a certain sense of instrumentalism. When it comes to rationality, and uh, the previous speech has been talked about this a whole lot, uh, heterodox schools apply the concept of environmental consistent rationality and satisfying agents. So agents have targets and they respond whenever they miss the targets, but they do not apply the concept of hypermodel consistent rationality and optimizing agents as we find them in mainstream or orthodox schools. Regarding method, we have holism and organicism on the one hand and individualism and atomicism on the other hand, whereas in Heterodox schools, you may have micro-macro fallacies of composition, uh, micro-macro paradoxes. These cannot show up in orthodox models because the macro is reduced to the micro, as already explained uh, in the previous presentation. If we look at the economic core, we have the focus on production, growth, and abundance in the heterodox schools. And uh, the, the, uh, in the orthodox schools, the start is with exchange, allocation, and scarcity, and production, and growth is rather uh, appended to this view of the world. Regarding the political core, we have regulated markets versus unfettered markets. So these are the five presuppositions uh, which you see here on the, on the left-hand side to which post-Keynesians, uh, or all post-Keynesians, I would argue, would subscribe. Now, there are different strands in post-Keynesian economics, and there has been a long debate whether you should or could consider yourself a post-Keynesian if you are uh, following a certain strand of these, or a certain type of uh, these strands. Uh, but I would advocate following, uh, again, Lavoie, John King, and other authors, Jeff Harcourt, is a big ten approach towards post-Keynesian economics, meaning that we should accept that there is pluralism within post-Keynesian economics. Um, and basically, again, following Marx's book, I would uh, argue that there are five strands. We have the fundamentalist, based on the works of Keynes, the older John Robinson, Minsky, Shackle, Weintraub, and focusing on fundamental uncertainty, the features of the monetary production economy, financial instability, and method. Then we have the Kaletskians, uh, based on the work of Mikhail Kaletsky, Joseph Steindl and the younger John Robertson, the focus is on cost plus pricing, class conflict, effective demand, income distribution and growth. We have the Caldorians, based on the work of Caldor, Harrod, Goodwin, Godley, focuses on growth, productivity regimes, open economy, uh, constraints <laughs> to growth, uh, and uh, linking up the economic and the financial system, in particular in the work uh, by Win Godley. Um, we have the Srafians and the Neo Ricardians, based uh, or uh, yeah, in, highly influenced by the work of Srafa and, and Garrick Nani and others. The focus is on uh, prices of production in multi sectoral systems, the choice of technique, capital theory as a critique of neoclassical uh, aggregate production theory, uh, and on long period positions of the economy. And finally, we have the institutionalist. Uh, drawing on the works of, of Veblen, John Kenneth Galbraith, Lerner, and Eichner. So this is, in a sense, uh, partly at least post-Keynesian microeconomics. So the focus is on pricing, the theory of the firm, monetary institutions, behavioral and labor e uh, economics. Now, the question is, what do these five strands have in common? And I would argue 
on top of these five presuppositions which uh, 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 characterize uh, heterodox economics, there are five essential characteristics which post-Keynesians have in common and which might distinguish them from other heterodox schools, let's say the Marxian schools, uh, the Marxian uh, school and the different uh, vari variants of Marx Marxism in modern economics. So first there's the focus on a monetary theory of production in which money is non-neutral in the short, but also in the long run, that's very important. Derived from this, we have the dominance of the principle of effective demand, also in the short and in the long run. We have the important, uh, importance of the notion of fundamental uncertainty, and based on that, the insistence that economic processes take place in historical and irreversible time, and that they are thus largely path dependent. And finally, although this might be debatable, but I would argue it matters in all the five strands of post-Keynesian economics, we have the importance of distributional issues and distribution conflict for economic outcomes. This morning or late, early afternoon, I called these the Ten Commandments of Post-Keynesian Economics. So if you uh, can subscribe to all ten of them, then you can consider yourself to be a post-Keynesian. You don't have to, but you can, um, at least to my definition. Um, oops, what's that? The stages of development of post-Keynesian economics, uh, we had the, the 30s and 40s, with, uh, which, in which all this started with Keynes' and Kolecki's revolution in macro. Then we had the 50s and 60s, in which the principle of effective demand was extended to the long period, so to distribution and growth. We had the first generation of distribution and growth models by Caldo and Robinson, and we had the critique of uh, neoclassical macro in the so-called capital controversy. In the 70s, uh, when uh, orthodox uh, macro, um, the neoclassic synthesis was in trouble, facing uh, the first great recession uh, in post-war capitalism, um, there was the search for a grand uh, theoretical system as an alternative to orthodox macroeconomics. We saw the foundation of the still, I would say, two most important journals for post-Keynesian, the Cambridge Journal of Economics and the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics. And we had important developments in post-Keynesian micro, so in the theory of the firm, uh, pricing theories, and so on. As we know, post-Keynesianism post did not replace the uh, orthodox uh, neoclassic synthesis. Instead of that, we had monetarism, and then we had the dominance of even new neoclassical economics. So in the 80s and 90s, which Fontana called the age of uncertainty, post-Keynesians went back to Keynes, and the question was what Keynes really meant, what Keynes really meant really. Um, we had uh, so the, the focus again on method, methodology, but we also had some textbooks uh, by Philip Orestes, Mark Lavoie, Paul Davidson, Tom Pally, and others. This was also the period in which uh, uh, the post-Keynesian theory of endogenous money was fully developed. The main contributor in this area, of course, was Basil Moore, and we had the elaboration of the financial instability hypothesis based on Minsky, or with Minsky as the uh, main contributor. And we had the second generation of post-Keynesian distribution and growth models, uh, the Kaletskin models with the works of uh, Bob Rothorn, Amitabha Dutt, and then Baduri and Martin. Now, the period which I will focus on in more detail in the major part of my presentation, so the late 1990s till <coughs> now, so to speak, have seen more and more applied work, uh, so more and more econometrics also uh, in post-Keynesian journals at post-Keynesian conferences, uh, a focus more and more on economic policies, and we've seen the development of integrated models of money distribution conflict effective demand, capital accumulation and growth, both at the analytical level, but also stock flow consistent simulation models. And maybe I should add, and I think this will be a topic for the next panel uh, tomorrow evening, uh, also the link of stock flow consistent modeling with agent-based modeling. Now let me come to the main part of my presentation. Um, so what has been achieved uh, in post-Keynesian macroeconomics over the last two decades. I'm not talking about progress, so I just talk about main development and I leave it to you whether you consider this to be progress. So uh, the first thing is the integration of distributional issues into short and long-run macro. 
the second area I would say is the integration uh, of money, finance, and macroeconomics, and finally, the economic policy uh, 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 conclusions which can be drawn from all that and which um, present an alternative to the dominant mainstream model, namely the new consensus uh, model. Oops, this was too. Let me start with the, with the first area, so the integration of distributional issues into short and long run macro. Um, of course, distribution conflict, in particular when you start from the Kaletskian, but also the Kaldorian, the Srafian strand of uh, post-Keynesian economics, distribution matters uh, in the short run in terms of uh, affecting aggregate demand, since we have different propensities to save out of different types of income. And distributional conflict is the major, major explanation for inflation in post-Keynesian models. If you turn to the long run, you have the two types of distribution and growth models, which I've already mentioned in my overview. We have on the one hand the calder pasinetti robinson uh, tradition, in which income shares at the end of the day are determined by capital expenditures because it is assumed that uh, at least the capital stock is used at a normal rate, so we have a normal rate of utilization of productive capacities given by the capital stock in the long run. In order to allow the adjustment of saving to investment, what you need in these models is a more flexible uh, price level as compared to the nominal unit labor cost, because otherwise you don't get the required redistribution. And the second uh, uh, generation post-Keynesian models, so the kaletsky steinle approach, income shares are determined by market pricing, and what is the adjusting variable in the medium to long run is not uh, income distribution, but it's the rate of capacity, the rate of capacity utilization, which allows for the adjustment of saving to investment also in the long run. We have two versions of the Kaletskian model, so we have the neo kaletskian growth model. Uh, by Dutt uh, and Rothorn, in which you only get wage-led uh, demand and wage-led growth as long as you are in a closed economy. If you add exports and imports to the model, then you may also have profit-led demand and profit-led growth, as Robert Blacker has already shown in 1989. Different from that, we have the post kaletskian growth model, um, put forward by the Dury Martin in 1990, and uh, also Heinz Courts in the same year, in which already for the closed economy you might get different regimes, profit or wage lead, and all this depends on the investment function in your model. Now, there have been three areas of debate around, or three to four areas of debate around these Kaletskian models, which at least to some authors, also at least to my perspective, has become uh, a kind of workhorse for many post-Keynesians. Uh, three areas of debate. The first one is the question of the endogeneity of the rate of capacity utilization beyond the short run. Herodians and Marxians um, have criticized that because uh, what you have is, according to their argument, a deviation of the rate of utilization from the normal or the target rate of utilization of firms in uh, the, uh, uh, in the long run, and, and, and according to their view, this is not a long run equilibrium because it would trigger responses by firms, invest, the investment function will uh, shift or will change, and if you uh, introduce these changes, then at least in most of the models, the paradox of costs, which is uh, fundamental for the neo kaletskian model, disappears. Now, post Keynesians have, or Kaletskians have responded to this critique, um, and the, we have had, have seen uh, uh, four to five types of responses. So Amitava Dutt has already argued in, the, in 1990 and then later on in the 2000s that there is no such definite normal or target rate of utilization of firms if you are living in a world of fundamental uncertainty and therefore we should consider the, rate of, the target rate of utilization as a range and within, within this range the equilibrium rate of utilization can now move without triggering any further responses in the system. Thomas Dallery and Til van Trek have argued in a paper in 2010 that firms may have, may have multiple goals and may accept a deviation uh, of the actual or 
actual rate of utilization or the goods market equilibrium rate of utilization from target in order to achieve other goals, other targets of the firm. For instance, a certain dividend payout ratio, ratio to their shareholders. Marc Lavoie has argued that firm's assessment of the trend growth and the normal rate may be endogenous to actual experience. I have argued in two papers that if as a critique, so to speak, of Dumenil and Levy, if you consider the normal rate as a stable inflation rate of utilization, it might become endogenous <coughs> to monetary policy responses, which in Dumenil and Levy is the adjustment mechanism. And in the <coughs> latest work on this issue by Olivier Alain, Marc Lavoie, it's been argued that uh, if you introduce an autonomous expenditure growth, which is not non-capacity uh, creating, which drives the system, you may have Kaletskian results at least regarding the growth path, not regarding the growth rate, but regarding the growth path, even if the system approaches the normal rate of utilization. I know there's still debate about this model. Peter Scott has criticized these models, and this is an ongoing debate. Uh, uh, but I think that this is basically uh, the state of the art in this area. A second area of debate is um, what, we, uh, what about feedbacks of uh, aggregate demand on distribution? Because usually, in particular in the Kalensky and medium to long run models, uh, what we assume is that income distribution is the exogenous variable and then we examine the effects of changes in distribution on aggregate demand and on growth. Again, Peter Scott has argued that Kaletskian should think about feedback effects. Now, I have taken a look at Kaletskian models, and again, I'm not claiming that I'm, I've been comprehensive, and there are several Kaletskian models who have included feedback effects of demand, uh, employment, or growth on distribution. But the problem is that these feedback effects are not unique, so there are different theories of how the level of economic activity could feedback on income distribution, even if you apply Kaletsky's theory of distribution. So the question is, why have Kaletskians not introduced these feedbacks into their medium to long run uh, uh, examinations of uh, the effects of distribution and growth, which then fed into the wage-led, profit-led literature? Well, I think the main argument is that these are medium to long run changes, and there is no unique feedback, in, in particular if you look at the medium and long run, and that these feedbacks are, uh, 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 may differ due to uh, the change in the social institutional environment, due to changes in social institutional factors. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, at least to my understanding, income shares are taken to be exogenous when it comes to the examina examination of profit versus wage-led growth. This brings me to my next point. So. These, the debate or the, the empirical uh, literature on profit and wage-led growth, and again, this will also be a topic, I think, tomorrow night, so let me just briefly uh, provide my take on that. If you look at the empirical results regarding profit, wage-led growth, uh, you can basically distinguish two types of approaches. Uh, and Engelbert Stockhammer and also uh, uh, Robert Blacker have made this distinction in their reviews and their contributions to this debate. On the one hand, you have the Kaletskian one-directional structural approach in which you estimate the effects of changes in the wage or the profit share on the different components of aggregate demand, and then you sum up, and then you either get wage or profit-led results. The usual result is that domestic demand is wage-led, whereas if uh, you add external demand, um, net exports, small open economies might turn profit-led in particular if they follow a redistribution strategy in isolation. Now different from that, the Goodwinian, as Engelbert calls them, the Goodwinian, so Peter Flaschel, uh, Lance Taylor and their co-authors have used a bidirectional or system aggregative approach in which they directly estimate the effects of distribution on economic activity and vice versa. And what they usually find is that total demand is profit-led, in particular for the US. But as Robert Blacker has pointed out at this conference, I think two years ago already, um, the main difference between these two approaches is the time horizon. Whereas the Kalenskians are interested in the medium to long-run effects of distribution on demand, the Goodwinians are mainly interested in the short-run 
interaction of these two uh, categories, which then generate uh, a kind of cyclical growth path. A very interesting empirical work by Bridgie and Sharp, which was presented at a workshop or small conference in Bielefeld this year, has shown that uh, in their empirical, long-run empirical data, they find exactly this difference. So if you do the empirical test, what they find that in the short run you might get profit-led results, whereas in the long run economies turn to be wage-led. However, there are still some empirical and also theoretical doubts whether we really have profit-led results in the short run. Empirically, Engelbert Stockhammer and Sterer have examined one of the uh, uh, key papers of the Goodwinians, the Barbosa, Fierio, and Taylor paper, and they found that uh, their profit-led results are a bit strange because what they find is it mainly comes through consumption, which is a kind of strange story. It means that the propensity to consume out of profits has to be higher than the propensity to consume out of wages. Furthermore, there are theoretical doubts if you include overheads, as Mark in his book and in uh, several paper, a couple of papers has shown, you might see uh, a rise in the profit share and a rise in, uh, in utilization, uh, sorry, a rise in uh, economic activity, a rise in demand, but this may simply due to the uh, overhead or the, the digression of unit overhead cost in an economic upswing and vice versa in a downswing. Furthermore, if you include credit and debt effects, things might look like profit-led, but in fact they are based on rising debt being taken by, let's say, households uh, in particular. This is what Stockhammer and Mitchell have shown in their paper. This leads me to a fourth area of debate among uh, post-Keynesians, namely, in the face of the current what well, the observation of what has happened, in particular since the early 2000s, uh, in the US and other countries, in which we've seen falling wage shares and rising inequality, but rising instead of falling private consumption, is the functional income approach still relevant? Is it still relevant to look at wage and profit shares? Is it still relevant to distinguish between wage and profit-led growth? Because what we would have expected for this period is a fall in consumption. Now, this had le has led several post-Keynesians uh, and Kaletskins to think about, uh, to change in particular the consumption functions in the model. We've introduced debt into workers' consumption. Amitabha Dutt has started with that based on some work of Tom Pally already in the 1990s. Other authors have in uh, introduced wealth and debt effects, in particular Baduri with uh, several co-authors. And as the latest fashion, what we've seen is the um, uh, uh, integration of the relative income hypothesis, hypothesis into Kaletskian macro models. So uh, Til van Trick with several co-authors, Carvalho, Ritzai, Capella, Schurz, um, and others. Empirically, what we find is that the uh, results regarding the relative income hypothesis are still a bit inconclusive. So there are papers which seem to show that this relative income hypothesis might be relevant, in particular for the, for the US. Other papers don't find effects. I think what we can say so far that financial and residential wealth, as well as debt effects on consumption, are quite robust if we look at empirical research, empirical estimations of consumption functions. Now, does that mean that functional income distribution is irrelevant? I would say no. I would still argue that the wage share is important because household debt, in particular workers' household debt, can only temporarily boost consumption without triggering financial instability. If we then look at the long run, what we find is financial fragility, financial crises, deleveraging, and then we are back to consumption being driven by income. However, it's not only functional income distribution which matters, it's also personal income dis distribution and in particular wage dispersion which matters. Tom Pally, uh, in several papers, I've only mentioned here the latest version, has shown that even if you should be in a profit-led regime, you can nonetheless uh, reduce wage dispersion and this will be expansionary. 
Okay, let me come to the second. How much time is left, Thorsten? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Okay, let me come to the second area, which is the integrate, integrated analysis of money, finance, and macro. Um, I don't want to touch upon the uh, debate uh, between horizontalist and structuralist uh, in, in post Keynesian monetary theory, because I think this is more or less resolved. When it comes to macro, what we should do, following already Pazinetti in 1974, uh, uh, we should include the rate of interest as a monetary phenomenon <coughs> which is exogenous to the income generation and the growth process. Now, the most fruitful uh, way of integrating interest, money, and finance into macro, I would argue, should not start with Keynes, but should start with Kolecki. Uh, Kolecki, in his principle of increasing risk, has provided a theory of investment in which investment of the firm sector at least partly depends on uh, the own means of finance of the firm. So the own means of finance, retained earnings uh, of the firm are a factor for investment and therefore a factor for the size of the firm. This has been then further developed by Steinle, or Steinle has integrated this in a slightly twisted version with his gearing ratio, and, we've, and Minsky has then, based on Kolecki, further developed this distinguishing between different types of investment finance, namely hedge, speculative, uh, speculative and Ponzi finance. So this was one way of integrating money and finance into the model. Then, of course, we have the latest models, which I've already mentioned, integrating household debt into uh, the macro models. The way it's been done, I've already mentioned this in my broad overview. On the one hand, we have seen small demand-driven analytical models. On the other hand, based on the work in particular of Wynne Godley and also drawing on uh, James Tobin's work at Yale, uh, we have seen the development of large-scale stock flow consistent models. Uh, and the Godley Lavoie book, I think, is the standard reference in this, this context. Now, what have been the results? And maybe I rushed through it a bit. The main results in the first uh, uh, types of models, focusing in particular of the integration of interest and credit into post Keynesian distribution and growth models, uh, has been on the one hand that you might have such a thing as a macroeconomic paradox of debt. Um, as it has already been found in Joseph Steinold's work, and Amitava Dutt has reformulated this model in 1995. Furthermore, we have then seen the distinction between debt-led Minskian regimes and debt-burdened regimes, uh, in particular entertained by Lance Taylor. Linked to that, because it relies on, on, on the similar parameter constellation, Marc Lavoie, in his paper in 1995, has made the distinction between normal, intermediate, and puzzling cases for the effects of interest rate and debt changes. Well, I have tried to argue that only, or Mark had already argued, and I have uh, ex expanded on that, that only debt-led and, and puzzling regimes seem to be stable, and this has triggered a debate with some Japanese colleagues, Sasaki and Fujita, and uh, also with Rainer Franke in Metro Economica, which is also ongoing. Furthermore, we've seen models including Minskian effects into this type of modeling. Uh, you have some names here and this have, has given rise to even more complex uh, and more complicated results. A second step in this kind of literature is the uh, financialization, integration, the integration of financialization into post-Keynesian models. All this started, uh, well, in the mid-2000s, I would argue, uh, financialization effects were integrated into the model through the main, com main, main components, the main equations of the model. So the distribution equation, the investment equation, the consumption equation, and if you have an open economy model also on the export and imports. It has been shown that financialization might trigger different regimes, a finance-led growth regime, profits without investment regimes, and contractive regimes. Empirically, uh, the results have been that at least for the period prior to the crisis, profits without investment regimes seem to have been dominating. Um, and there, two types have developed. On the one hand, the debt-led private demand boom. On the other hand, the export-led mercantilist regimes. If you're interested in that, the Fesut project has uh, several studies on that on several countries 
which might give you a clue in which regime a specific country has been before the crisis. Now, since this um, uh, uh, debt-led private demand boom regime, as for instance in the US, or the counterpart, the export-led mercantilist regime, as for instance in Germany or in China, have not shown to be sustainable, but have rather created imbalances and therefore contributed to the severity of the great uh, of the financial crisis and in particular the Great Recession, post-Keynesians have come up with alternative strategies, um, wage-led or mass income-led recovery regimes. Um, others have extended that and have argued that, well, this is, might be a good idea, but it might be A, not enough, and B, B, it might be difficult to achieve because you put a whole lot of burden on, in particular, the trade unions, uh, you should rather integrate this in a Keynesian New Deal, which would have to be a broader policy package, uh, including the re-regulation of finance, the redistribution of income, the re-orientation uh, of macro policy, and also the recreation of international policy coordination. Um, this brings me to my last area of, of research, the alternatives to uh, the new consensus model. Um, <coughs> Post-Keynesians have criticized the new consensus model right from the start. In particular, Philip Orestes, together with Malcolm Sawyer, have been at the forefront of that. Oops, what happened here? Um, and others. What's been the main critique? The main critique has been that the narrow, which is the core of the new consensus model, is not or, sh or should not be considered to be independent from the development of actual unemployment. The assumption of the neutrality of money in the new consensus model, monetary policies only affect the rate of inflation in the long run, and the focus on the rate of interest as the only policy tool. Based on that, post-Keynesians have developed alternative models, and maybe I don't go into the details here. Uh, you see a whole list of contribution. Alternative models which in effect reverse the hier hierarchy uh, included in orthodox modeling, orthodox modeling which at least in the long run has the labor market and the wage bargaining system uh, at the center, putting the financial and the goods market uh, at the center or at the top and deriving the results from there. Based on that, post Keynesians <coughs> have proposed a completely alternative policy mix as compared to the new consensus model. Instead of inflation targeting monetary policies, post Keynesians have argued monetary policies should target low interest rates because this affects distribution. On top of that, the monetary authorities should care for uh, 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 monetary and financial stability. Fiscal policies, instead of just balancing the budget, should contribute to real stabilization in the short and in the long run without any uh, deficit or debt target, and it should also take care of the distribution of income. Labor market and incomes policies should ca take care of stabilizing the rate of inflation um, and uh, uh, therefore go for stab steady and stable nominal unit labor cost growth and a compressed wage structure. It does not, according to the post Keynesian view, determine the equilibrium rate of unemployment. When it comes to international economics, Post-Keynesians are more in favor of regulated capital flows, managed exchange rates, infant industry protection, and regional industrial policies as a development model instead of free trade, free capital flows, and flexible exchange rates. When it comes to coordination, instead of a clear-cut assignment in the orthodox or new, a new consensus tradition, post-Keynesians would always argue for coordination at the uh, national and the international level. There is debate within post-Keynesian economics, both with respect to what exactly monetary policies should do, with respect to fiscal policies, is there really no uh, debt limit? I'm fine. Uh, with regard to wage policies, uh, can we do more than just stabilize the, uh, the, uh, uh, the price level or the rate of inflation? And with regard to international policies, some people are arguing, in particular, the uh, MMT school around Randy Ray that maybe floating exchange rates are a better idea than managed fixed exchange rates. This is ongoing debate. Again, I would argue it's debate within the post-Keynesian research pro uh, program. It's a necessary debate um, uh, within a research program. Now, final thoughts, and Torsten gave me the two minutes. Um, 
the first thing, I haven't hardly talked about micro versus macro. Of course, there is post-Keynesian microeconomics. If you look at the two books by John King or Marc Lavoie, they have chapters on micro. And John King is quite explicit regarding the basic principles of post-Keynesian micro. So decisions of firms are the driving force in the post-Keynesian view. Uh, firms and households operate in oligopolistic or monopolistic uh, markets. And we have fundamental uncertainty and satisfying behavior. What about the micro foundation of macro? Well, some post-Keynesians have argued, well, we rather need the macro foundation of micro. Well, again, I would side with John King, who, uh, <coughs> who argues that we should neither go for one of these two, because the micro foundation of macro is just a micro reduction of macro. His argument is that micro and macro are different spheres of economic analysis. Of course, they influence each other, uh, and we can integrate uh, results from the micro level into our macro model. In, in fact, we've done that. We have uh, seen changes in the post-Keynesian theory of the firm in the context of financialization. We have seen changes in the theory of consumption, the relative income hypothesis. All this based on <coughs> micro research, all this <coughs> based on research regarding household, and that's my last slide, uh, and uh, firm behavior. What are the areas for future research? I would just like to mention three. Integration of ecological and environmental issues into macro, integration of gender issues into macro, and the refocus uh, on the political economy dimension and the social embeddedness of economic processes. Final word on pluralism. I think pluralism is required. It's required because of complexity, because of historic specificity of our subject, and it's required for progress. I would argue post-Keynesian economics is a pluralist research program, but it's, it's still coherent. We have the Ten, Com uh, ten Commandments. And I would argue post-Keynesian's macroeconomics in particular can provide the macro for a pluralist political economy research program. Thank you very much, and apologies for being a bit over time.